Hey, it's Robert Fithin. I just got finished watching the Beatles Get Back documentary for the second time, uh, directed by Peter Jackson, of course, available to view on Disney+. And I thought I'd share some of my thoughts and maybe sneak in a couple of scenes here so you can check out. The very first thing I noticed uh, or loved about this documentary was it kind of starts the same way as the old Let It Be with uh, them kind of setting up stools and setting up, uh, you know, the drum face and, and chairs and equipment and things like that. It's real sparse. They're at that Twickenham studio, which has the real colorful background, uh, you know, the backdrop behind them with the green and red and purple and whatever. And then the other way you face the camera, it's just really this dank, large kind of like, I don't know, airport hangar looking thing. And uh, they don't do very well there. But the very first part of the film that I love was when it shows them rehearsing. And there's a really, the bulk of this documentary, eight hours, is them jamming and just working on songs. You get to see lyric changes. You get to see songs develop. You get to see songs that, uh, that wouldn't really develop in time. So they're later for Abbey Road. Uh, but one of my favorite things is watching them work on songs that would later become uh, solo uh, songs for future albums when they did their solo stuff. You've got them working on um, Give Me Some Truth, John Lennon's song, Paul's Teddy Boy is in there, George's All Things Must Pass, a bunch of others as well. So I thought that was really interesting to check them out, uh, working on songs that wouldn't be Beatles songs, but actually solo songs. The comparisons could go on and on between this new eight-hour Get Back documentary and the original Let It Be film, but I was uh, I was pleased to finally see director Michael Lindsay Hogg. He made an appearance in this. He's quite uh, in it quite a lot, and I did not expect uh, what I saw. I didn't. I've never seen Michael Lindsay Hogg, the director of uh, Let It Be, before, and uh, he's got this baby. He's this baby-faced guy that's always chomping on a cigar he's very uh a very unique guy and i was also glad to see so much of uh the uh you know the producer glenn johns in there as well as the beatles producer george martin i'll get more on uh, george martin later and it was great to see that they included a lot of footage of their longtime roadie mal evans but a lot of people stopping by like peter sellers you get to see dick james the infamous dick james they talk about alan klein a little bit but he never actually makes an appearance uh, in the movie. But back to the Beatles, and they're rehearsing. I love the jamming. I love the back and forth. And uh, everybody kind of wonders, what's the deal with uh, the back and forth? Is it more like, uh, you know, like happy-go-lucky stuff? Did they cut all the arguing out? Well, I don't know, because it's originally 60 hours, so who knows what they cut out. But they did leave in a little bit of the George and, and Paul kind of conflict. Well, I don't think you should. Yeah, okay, well, I don't mind. I'll, I'll play, you know, whatever you want me to play. Or I won't play at all if you don't want me to play. You know, whatever it is that will please you, I'll do it. But I don't think you really know what that one is. You saw a smidgen of that in the original Let It Be. It's a little more elongated here. I guess they were able to pull up audio tracks and uh, remove, like... Uh, noise and guitar sounds and whatever so you can actually hear the dialogue you can hear what they're saying better so uh, you get a little more of the argument but then I felt like when George leaves it's rather abrupt he kind of seems disgruntled through most of the whole movie but he does get a little more agitated right before uh, and then all of a sudden I'm leaving the band when now and then it cuts to a still image and just some kind of talking about, yeah, we'll put an ad in enemy and we'll, we'll find a replacement and we'll work on your residuals and all that. And then it's done. It cuts to like the next day. So you don't really get to see a lot. Of, I guess that footage wasn't available or maybe they didn't want to show it. But for whatever reason, you don't really see a lot of George leaving. It's a very, very small segment. Uh, I think I'll be leaving the band now. When? Now. Yeah. Well, I don't think you should a uh, spoiler alert he does rejoin the group so all is well in a couple of days now i don't know really obviously like i said there's 60 hours of footage so it's not really known what was left out or what they did to kind of uh you know kind of guide the story along but from what it looks like in the end product some of the things that i thought went on with the beatles later on are kind of like different than what's presented it was really eye-opening for me um you know the, the beatles kind of get put in their little slots you know which isn't reality but that's that's how it is you know you had paul 
the the cute one with the love songs and the great melodies you had john the serious one the smart one with the glasses he could be a little intimidating get a little upset you had george the hippie guy who just wanted to hang out a piece and and just you know just had his own thing going on and you had ringo who was always ringo thankfully in this movie it seemed like paul was a little more of the in charge guy a little more of the boss i know the story goes that john was basically in charge of the beatles until around 66 or something and then the dynamic kind of changed a little bit especially after brian epstein's death and it seems like paul is uh the, in charge here in fact there's a scene where he refers to that that's good if you be the boss and i have been for like a couple of years but there's also a scene where there's a hidden microphone in a flower pot Love that, where uh, Paul was saying that John used to always be the boss. And by the way, I love the trickery of putting, you got hidden microphones and flower pots during secret meetings in this movie. You've got hidden cameras hidden from the police so they can do their business in the Abbey Road when they have to break in at the end without knowing there's cameras on them. You gotta love the espionage of the, uh, of the original Let It Be production. And it's great to know that if you're part of a Beatles film crew that you get to go ahead and play around with their instruments while they're out of the room. Who would, do, would you do that? I wouldn't do that. But back to the way people are presented, it looks more like Paul is the in-charge guy. He is the one that just wants to get to work, wants to do this project. He's got his, you know, his eye on the goal. He's, he's a little more regimented. John is more of the fun guy. John comes off as jovial and just wanting to joke around all the time. Every time a conversation gets a little bit serious, he starts playing like old Beatles songs. You know, even when it, even a lyric from an old Beatles song that has something to do with the conversation, seemingly to kind of lighten things up. John's the fun one. Paul's the serious business guy. George is like sourpuss grumpy smurf through the whole thing. And Ringo is Ringo. <laughs> but more about George being kind of grumpy, you can kind of see why he's, he's kind of like not with things and, and isn't in tune, doesn't want to do his songs on the rooftop, doesn't want to do the concert, doesn't want to do this, doesn't want to do that. Uh, quits the band, all that. You can kind of see uh, one scene here, especially where they basically just make fun of his musical contributions. Well, I'll get on the battle <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't care if you don't want it. <laughs> now george harrison's work isn't the only thing ridiculed by the beatles if you watch closely you can pick up on little slight jabs at people like the animals uh canned heat uh they mentioned peter Gor peter and gordon that song they wrote for them that's kind of a funny part of the movie as well uh, some other people brought up one thing i love though is the scenes where you can actually see uh, different members of the beatles with different record albums being a you know big record collector and music collector i love seeing uh the things from what would maybe be later in the beatles record collection and there's a lot of great times in get back uh documentary as well i think some people have actually kind of faulted it for that saying that it kind of puts a rosy gloss on a tough time in the Beatles' life, but there is a lot of jamming, there's a lot of rocking out, and when you're doing that, I guess you kind of have to be having a little bit of fun. So there's a lot of smiles, there's a lot of joking around, there's a few serious bits thrown in, but it seems like, as like I said before, as soon as it starts to get a little serious, either Lennon or somebody comes in to immediately lighten things up, or the camera just, suddenly we're in a different scene now. So I, I don't know if that footage is gone, or they just didn't want to use a lot of it. Again, eight hours out of 60 hours with the footage and one of the great fun things i loved seeing was uh billy preston's entrance when this thing started to get a little dour everybody started to get a little down it started to get a little samey you know everybody you, you got the same four beatles here playing the same four songs over and over rehearsing it's great to see somebody like billy preston walk in smiling excited to be there enthusiastic and it really does just lift the spirit of the entire production lifts the spirit of the room obviously at the time uh john lennon paul mccartney actually uh you know com comment on that but uh, yeah, you get to see him come in and just just kind of like bring the light, you know, back to the Beatles uh, recording sessions. And they're discussing right there how they've got to put him on the album. They've got to credit him. How is he going to be paid? Let's sign this guy. Cut to two days later, they've already signed him. They've gotten him away from his old label, label of Capital. So it was the whole B Billy Preston part was uh, just great to see. Now, some other guests that came in, 
Uh, of course, Yoko is there a lot of the time. Her, her presence really isn't um, like front and center. She's usually off to the side or something, not really participating a lot. She puts in a few comments every once in a while, but this is definitely not a hate Yoko Ono documentary, and you knew it wouldn't be. She's one of the main producers of this. So, uh, But yeah, Yoko Ono shown in a fairly good light. Uh, Linda Eastman's little daughter, though. I could do without the unruly little child. I hate children running around, disrupting things, beating on drums they're not supposed to be doing, jumping on people, talking while pe while adults are talking. Here's the thing. I remember being a little kid and being around grown-ups, and a couple of times I was around grown-ups in a work situation. You better believe my mouth was shut. I was sitting in a chair. I didn't move. This little girl's running around. I just, uh, it, I, I will take five scowling yokos over one obnoxious little girl running around <laughs> but uh fun times there with the uh, beatles as well now for some real funny stuff you got to know a little more about this guy named magic alex he designed this studio that they were supposed to be recording in and this guy i guess turned out to really not know what he was doing at all and just kind of a flim flam guy or whatever big big smoke and mirrors thing and they had to redo the whole studio at the last minute with emi equipment that's all in the movie but one thing also in the movie is when they get this uh new uh guitar invention from magic alex a, a bass slash rhythm guitar and well you can see what it looks like here and you can see their reaction to that how'd you tune it and this is the okay. muffle on the two-sided bass rhythm muffle. what <laughs> It looks oh, like let's it. give him half a million quid. It looks a good idea. Yeah. 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 Well, let's ball. give it him just for this. <laughs> put it on show. <laughs> <laughs> Another great scene is the one uh, early on in one of the days when uh, it's just George and Ringo there. So Ringo's doing uh, an early version of what would become Octopus's Garden. And you can see how George is kind of helping him out, understand like uh, melody structure and things like that. It's a really great moment in the movie. Now, if you're wondering about other controversial content, like maybe like they did in the history of the Eagles and the Tom Petty three-hour things that they did, maybe they're showing the Beatles doing some drugs or something like that or talking about drugs there really isn't a lot of that there's a little bit of discussion uh regarding drugs yes i just yeah. uh, was up late you know i was yeah. sort of stoned and i watching films and i wouldn't have made it anyway is there any need to do this in public mr leonard but mostly it's done in the form of like humor or like a one-off comment or something like that here's a scene i noticed though what has john lennon got here he looks like he puts it right back in his pocket and then gets a real guilty look on his face like he forgot there was a there was a film crew there i I don't know what that was, but I thought that was pretty interesting. You may have noticed you're not hearing any Beatles music in this uh, in this review, and I, I'm sure a lot of you know the reason why you can't use Beatles music. The video will just be you know pulled from YouTube, and then no one will see it. But hopefully, you know what the Beatles sound like, and uh, you may have the Get Back Naked or some of the sessions or the old Get Back Bootleg or whatever. But uh, I definitely recommend this documentary to any Beatles fan. Like I said, I don't know how much of it is, uh, you know, kind of skewed in one direction. Eight, 60 hours of footage whittled down to eight. But it's so much more comprehensive than the Let It Be movie. The Let It Be movie is, has been rendered completely, completely unnecessary uh, by this new Get Back uh, documentary. And you get to see everything involved with the actual planning that plan doesn't work throw that out now we're going to do this that doesn't work so that gives you a little bit of inspiration if the beatles can keep you know missing deadlines and missing goals and having to reevaluate then you know everybody can do that everybody uh, has to do that so if the beatles are doing it i think that gives a lot of us some inspiration if they can make mistakes it's okay for all of us to make mistakes i really love the way that peter jackson laid this movie out too there's obviously a lot to work with here and uh you know 60 hours so they really did a great way they sp they split it between days you get these cool calendar day transitions to let you know exactly where you are what day it is it it appears as though every day starts out you know everybody's just getting there you see everybody arriving one by one you get to see you get to see it in a working environment which beetles get to work on time ready to go got stuff prepared which ones just kind of saunder in i'm gonna leave that for you watching the documentary to figure out uh which goes which with there but i will say one thing ringo star always there on time always working not a lot of bitching not a lot of whatever ringo's ringo uh but i really love this documentary eight hours long disney plus is of course where you can see it uh again a lot of jamming a lot of song development you see how the actual uh, song get back started as a protest song 
about a specific thing that was going on in England at that time. I'm glad they didn't do that because that would have made it very dated very quickly. And uh, so, you know, you get to see that whole like idea kind of tossed out and then go into like, uh, you know, we know we're in Arizona. Now we're now we know it's Tucson, Arizona. So you get the whole song development of things like that. And of course, it ends with the big rooftop concert. These guys on the roof, the legendary concert, the thing you've been waiting for to see almost in its entirety. I did notice, though, that they still cut away from the actual performance and talk to people on the street with the music continuing in the background. So we still don't have a complete full shot you know, all music, all video of the Beatles rooftop concert. They did, they still did the cutaways, but I now have a better understanding of the rooftop concert. I never understood why that wasn't released on like an album or a CD part or at the end of Anthology 3 or something. And I think the reason is, and I didn't understand this before, it's not like an ordinary concert. They go up there, they do like four songs, and then they do three of those songs again. And that's the end of the concert. So it's not really, you know, your typical set list. It's all the songs repeated twice except for one of them. So uh, I got, I'm glad I finally understand that. I, I definitely have a better understanding of everything that went on in the Let It Be process. The only um, gripe I have is that it ends sort of right after the rooftop concert. It shows the next day when they go back and they're mixing, uh, you know, the ballads, Long and Winding Road and Let It Be and all that. And they put a few finishing touches on some other songs. But then that's the end of the movie. It doesn't show the Let It Be album being completed. I really wanted to know what the deal with Phil Spector was. You've got George Martin in this whole movie kind of hanging around waiting to be the producer when the final flourishes and the final mixes are going to be done, and you don't know what happened. Uh, obviously, the Let It Be album, produced by uh, Phil Spector, um, the singles were produced by George Martin, and um, we don't know exactly judging by this film what happened with that i would have you know I, I guess they don't have film of that they didn't have a film crew around but i would have loved some text on the screen or something some still photos or something to explain um what happened between the end of the recording sessions and the release of the album but that probably would have been a whole other hour but i wouldn't have complained about a nine hour get back documentary so that's really my only complaint is i wish they would have gone fully into the album the release why Phil Spector, that whole thing, but they really just made this more of a documentary about the making of the film and all of the ideas, like the TV special and all that, that they had that were later obviously thrown out. But overall, an excellent documentary. I'm so glad. Like I said, I would have watched a nine-hour one. I would have watched a 20-hour one, and hopefully when this thing comes out on on Blu-ray or DVD or whatever physical media they're going to release, it's probably part of some box set or something, uh, I, I really hope there's all kinds of extras. I would love to see even more footage. I, I, people are like, eight hours? How about a two and a half hour version? Fine. That's for you guys. I would have loved a 20 hour version. I'm, I'm still waiting for the 20 minute Helter Skelter. Where's that? But uh, yeah, Beatles Get Back documentary. You knew it was going to be awesome. It is. You don't need me to recommend it to you, but I do. Uh, I definitely recommend this. Uh, great. Uh, only a few little minor complaints, as I mentioned, but overall an incredible experience. And uh, hopefully uh, you liked my video on it. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Maybe subscribe to the videos so you don't miss any future ones. It certainly does help. Once again, I'm Robert Fithin, and uh, thank you so much for watching.